All right. In this video, I want to talk about killing Jesus. <coughs> you may be wondering what this picture is. Well, here's a depiction of the king of Israel receiving the scroll that God told Jeremiah to write. And the king reads it, and he cuts it up and throws it into the fire. This is prophetic because God sends his word, Jesus Christ, to Israel and he rebukes the leadership. And what do they do? They end up beating him and humiliating him and putting him up on the cross, on the altar, and killing him. You see, we're told in the scriptures that the Lamb of God represents the perfect, pure sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But the word of God itself is God with us. When Israel received the Torah from Moses, they received the word of God. Right? <laughs> God was with them. And there was a period of time where they lost the word of God. It was hidden in the temple. And again, a prophecy for Israel where the word of God's going to leave. You're going to be in the heavenly temple and they're going to fall away. But then when he comes back, they, they discover the word of God again and they repent because when they lost the word of God, they fell into apostasy. Right? So we know that today, by faith we have Jesus Christ within us. So we know he's with us. But his physical representation here on earth, you can say is us as Christians, but we're imperfect. Right? We're infallible. Not infallible. We're fallible. But the scriptures, the King James Bible, is perfect. It's inerrant. It's Jesus' representation here on earth. And how you treat that Bible is how you treat Jesus. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to get into here. It's basically a continuation of what I've been doing with Matthew, bringing out teachings from different chapters. Right now I'm in Matthew chapter 21, and I was reading some of this stuff, and I was remembering some things Jesus said about the end where there'll be false Christs, right? They'll claim that Jesus is the Christ. But they'll deceive many. And a lot of people think that that means people claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be Jesus himself. And in a sense, that that is what it's talking about. But you also got to realize it's talking about the word of God. There's going to be false words of God claiming Jesus is the Christ, but deceive many. So let's come over here to Matthew 21 here. <clears throat> Jesus is mainly dealing with the, the Pharisees in the section at the end here that I want to focus on. <clears throat> I'm going to go through these uh, paragraphs here. Matthew 21, verses 23 through 27, it says, And when he was come into the temple... 
the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? Now, the context is, is that he, when he came into the temple, he threw out the money changers. Right? So they're like, what are you doing? Who, what makes you think you have the authority to do these things? And they're like, who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, now, now look at the hypocrisy here, that they're cowards that care nothing about the truth. Because they're reasoning within themselves, they say, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. <clears throat> so they're trying to think, okay, how can we answer this? Because we don't believe he was of God, but the people do. So what do we do? Instead of telling the truth, and saying, we don't, we don't believe it was of heaven. We believe he's of men. Instead of just straight up telling the truth. They cowered. And they gave a little bit of a, a half truth. Because they could tell. They just didn't want to, right? Because of the reaction they would get from either answer. Right? Because they, they weren't concerned about the truth. They were concerned about their authority and their authority over Jesus. Right? So they were just trying to find a way that they could answer to keep their status and to put Jesus down. Right? Uh, which ends up happening when you talk to a lot of different people. Uh, namely, like Catholics, I'll talk to Catholics all the time, and I will talk to them about something in the scriptures, something that seems to be straightforward, right? And they'll say something along the lines of, well, who who told you to believe that? What authority do you have? And it's just kind of like, what? What education do you have? And it's like, Okay, well, what education do I need, and what authority do I need, and who needs to tell me that 2 plus 2 equals 4 for me to tell you that 2 plus 2 equals 4? I don't need anything. I mean, it's just common sense. Even if I never went to school, but I figured out on my own 2 plus 2 equals 4, I mean, it, that's the truth. It doesn't matter if I went to school to learn that. It doesn't matter if a certain professor told me that. It doesn't matter if I have authority or not. The authority is actually the truth itself. That 2 plus 2 equals 4. You don't need some special authority to proclaim the truth. Or to be able to just read something simply and take it for what it says. But when I was reading this, I was thinking that's a kind of the reaction I get from these people. Where you get something from uh, a recent topic I was talking with Catholics about was uh, Jesus's brothers and sisters, where you can clearly see it, uh, especially in Matthew 13, where it actually names four of his brothers by name, right? And they just act like, who who taught you that? I was like, well, it says it right there. Uh, so I guess you can say God, because this is God's word. It's his infallible word. And it says he has brothers. It names James, Joseph, and Judas. And I can't remember the, the third one, Jesse or something like that. So, yeah. I mean, it says it right there, his brothers. It's not something I made up. It's what it clearly says. But they dismiss it because they want to have their authority, as in the Catholic Church has the authority, right? And you can see the same thing going on here. Because after they answer him and they say, uh, we cannot tell. So they can't tell if it was from heaven or from men. And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. So he basically 
dismiss them. Just like they, okay, we're not going to answer the question. We're going to dismiss John. Uh, well, well, he does the same thing to them then. All right, well, I'm going to dismiss your question and not answer you. All right? And they have no reasonable objection. If they did say anything, it would have been foolish. I mean, if they were online, I'm pretty sure they would have rejected. But my, uh, yeah, wouldn't scroll down for a second. Now, he, he continues to talk to him here. And he says, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. So we see here, repented, he changed his mind. Right? He wasn't going to do it, but then he's like, okay, I'm going to go do it. Right? And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he, and he answered and said, I, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of the twain did the will of his father? They said unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go to the kingdom of God before you. Notice that this is not the kingdom of heaven, it's the kingdom of God. And he's saying that, yeah, the publicans and the harlots, they're the ones that were like, no, we're not going to go do your will. But then they repent, and then they were like, we're going to go do what you ask. So they ended up doing the will of God. And he's basically saying that they're the ones that are like, yeah, we're going to go do your will. But then they don't actually go do it. Right? Uh, which is what you find with a lot of... Christian leadership these days. An outward show of righteousness and what have you. But not really. A bunch of hypocrisy. And he says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. So he calls them out. Even though they didn't answer the question, he calls them out saying, You don't believe him. So now they're going to have to either just accept the fact that they don't, and they have to admit that by basically ignoring it. If they don't rep reply saying, we do believe him, well, then Jesus' statement stands because he's calling them out. You don't believe. So they have to now say they do, but they don't, right? So it puts them in a bind again. So they basically stay silent on that thing, hoping people just forget that he said that, right? which is what a lot of people do when you're talking to them online and what have you. But anyway, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that ye might believe him. So we see here uh, the same connection that we get from Mark chapter 1, verse 15, where Jesus preaches the kingdom of God, and he says, uh, repent and believe the gospel. You notice right here at this last verse, it's talking about repenting and believing. Because repentance is going from unbelief to belief in your heart. Uh, the perfect example of it would be the two thieves on the cross. Both were mocking Jesus, but one of them repents. As in, he goes from unbelief to belief. Because at first he's like, yeah, this is just another sinner like me. But then he's realizing, this is the Lord. And he believes he's going to raise from the dead because he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So right there is repentance. He went from unbelief to belief, right? Uh, and that's an important thing to know here because a lot of people like to say repentance means to turn from sin. Uh, no, because if you think that's repentance and you try to turn from sin, your focus is going to be on your sin. 24-7 and you trying not to sin instead of going from truly believing in God and trusting in him looking to him you're focused on something else right and that's what why they use this little subtle trickery trying to tell you that repentance is something else yes repentance at times can mean simply turning from something such as turning from sin but they want you focused on that, turning from sin, when your focus should be just simply turning to God and believing him. Because if you're focused on turning from your sin, you're never really going to truly do it. 
right? And you're just walking on eggshells for your entire life. You're never actually turning to God. You're constantly fighting yourself instead of just letting it go, turning to God, right? Trusting in him. But uh, this one is what really triggered this, this whole video for me. Just talking to them here about this parable. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what they're doing to Jesus today. So we got here, verse 33 to 46, to end the chapter of Matthew 21. It says, here another parable. There's a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits that of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Now, kind of like Jeremiah, right? What stuff that happened to him and the other prophets, right? Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, that being Jesus, right? He's coming to them now, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And let us seize on his inheritance. So you see what they want to do. They know that Jesus is the son. He's the rightful heir. He owns everything. Right? So they're thinking, well, we're the husbandmen, right? We're, we, can control, we control this place right now. And if he comes and if we kill him, well, then we're going to be the ones in control here. Will be able to rule. So, what do you think they're doing today? Well, they see the King James Bible. And like, this is the authority, the authorized version. It's perfect, it, it's inerrant, it's infallible, and it's our the light for our feet. It's what we can trust in. Right? It's a rock for us to stand upon. So that we're not tossed to and fro by the waves or building on shifting sand. Right? So what they want to do is destroy the King James. And sometimes they do it subtly by just saying, oh, here and there, this is not quite the right translation. And what it really means is here. And it doesn't seem to be like a big deal what they're saying. Right? That's just a little change. It doesn't seem to change the meaning or anything. Right? So you're like, oh, it gets you to doubt the King James, which opens the door for other versions. But then when you take a look at these other versions, you'll notice that there's a lot of changes. A lot of times they remove a lot of the verses. Uh, one big one that sticks out in my head right now is Acts 8.37, where it talks about the eunuch being baptized and what's hindering him from being baptized. He has to truly believe with his whole heart. They don't want you focusing on the belief because that's the true repentance, going from unbelief to belief. That's the key. It doesn't matter if you get baptized if you don't believe, right? So they do, do things that actually change the meaning of the passage, that changes doctrine in these other versions. Sometimes there's passages that contradict. Uh, I remember reading the ESV and Isaiah 14, it calls Lucifer the morning star. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Because then I was like, go flip back over to like Revelation in Peter. And Peter talks about the morning star. Jesus is going to give us the morning star that will rise in our hearts. And then in Revelation, Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. And it's like, okay. Uh, so Lucifer is the morning star too? So Jesus is Lucifer. Lucifer is Jesus. You can see the confusion that comes about right there, right? you start doubting things and being like, what's going on? So Jesus was the one in Eden that tempted Adam and Eve. He's the serpent. Wait, 
Lucifer's the one that died for our sins on the cross? You see how that mixes a whole lot of things up? A lot of confusion and doubt. So they get you to step back and be like, oh, I don't know what's what. I don't have a solid rock to stand on. I got shifting sand because of all these different versions because you're doubting the King James. So now you're, what do you truly believe? Oh, if we don't have the inerrant word of God. We don't have an infallible word of God. Then we don't have an authority, right? The authority basically becomes one of two things, more so one than the other. Uh, it's either going to become your favorite denomination, the one you agree with, right? And they're the one that's the authority now, even though they're just men and women like you are, right? They're not above you in any way. They're not closer to God than you are. We both can come straight to God, right? But all of a sudden now they're the authority. Oh, that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted to kill the heir so that they can have the inheritance. They can keep their position of authority. That's why they rejected Jesus as king. Because they knew if Jesus became king, they lose their authority. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin doesn't have their authority over the people anymore. So they're like, hey, we kill him. We get to keep our position. And that's exactly why the King James is attacked. You destroy their authority. You destroy the king, Jesus. Then who's the authority now? Oh, well, you can't trust the word of God. You know, all these Bibles, there's something wrong with it. So it's the church you got to trust. Well, which one? Well, you might pick one, but ultimately it, it all leads to Rome. Right? The, the new seed of the Pharisees and the scribes. Right? So I hope you, you're seeing how this all is playing out today as well. Because when Bibles were being translated into other languages, what did the Catholic Church do? Seized them and threw them into the fire. Huh. Is that history repeating itself or what? Oh, it's because they're heretical and there's errors. But they're not going to tell you the heresy that's in them. They're not going to tell you the errors. They're just going to tell you that's what's what. And you just believe what they say because they're the authority. You don't get to look and decide for yourself. Well, I'm pretty sure that's what the king will say. Hey, why'd you throw that into the fire? Oh, it's full of heresy and errors. Well, what's the heresy? What errors? Can we read it to see what it was? No, I'm just going to protect you from that and throw it into the fire. Oh, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You're such a great king. Like, you know, because when you're in a position like that and as a king, a government authority, religious authority, our sinful natures like that position. And we don't want to let it go. We don't want to end up submitting to God because we like being high and above others. We all have a little bit of narcissistic tendencies. Uh, but anyway, let's continue with this. And it says here at verse 39, And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Thus condemning themselves with their own words, right? We're all judged by our own words, and they agreed. They are those husbandmen. So they said, hey, destroy them. And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So he judged them by their own words. Right? Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read the scriptures? You're going to notice that a lot in uh, the Gospels and what have you. Is Jesus often talks about, it is written, have you not read? Did you never read the scriptures? Because that's the authority, right? He is the embodiment of the word of God, the embodiment of the scriptures. Like everything he says and do, does has to do with what is written. It's crazy. It's like the Bible is 
his DNA or something. His lifeblood. But anyway, uh, he says, Did he never read the scriptures? The stone which the builder rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And you see, they said this as an answer to his parable. So he's like, okay, well, that's how I'm going to judge you. You see, this is just like the wisdom of Solomon, where he makes righteous judgments. Like the uh, woman who came trying to get her son back from the woman who took her baby because her baby died, right? The woman's baby died, so she took the other woman's baby. And Solomon's like, okay, you know what? Let's just cut the baby in half so you can each have half the baby. And the one, one woman was like, okay with it. The other one was like, no, 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 it's okay. She can keep the baby. So then he was like, oh, I know which one's really the mother, right? You judge them by their own reactions, their own words. And that's what Jesus did here, that same wisdom. And judge them by their own decree, right? And uh, when he talks about this rock, he is that rock. Every time you read about Petra, the rock in the scriptures, it's talking about God, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You fall upon him, you are broken, and you realize you can't save yourself. And then you call upon him to save you, and then he heals you and restores you. He needs to break us because of our sinful nature. We're very rebellious. You know, like there's certain children that just won't submit to you, even when it's you're, you want to do things for their good. They just fight you, right? They look at you as the enemy, and you got to punish them. And then at times you got to whoop their ass because you have to break their stubborn will, or else it's going to hinder them. and Put them on a course that's going to be self-destructive, right? Because they're just like a rebel without a cause. There's no actual point other than to rebel, right? That's basically all it is. You tell them, hey, uh, take better, better care of yourself. And they're like, you know what? I'm going to do even worse, right? They just do the opposite for some reason. But once we are broken, like when you finally get the child to smarten up, then you can heal that relationship and you can start building them up, right? You can actually start teaching them and giving them wisdom of life. But first they have to have their will broken so that they'll even listen to you so that you can help them and heal them and get them uh, ready for life, right? Uh, but anyway, it wraps up by saying, And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parable, they perceived that he spake of them. So it finally clicked, right? But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So you see here, they, they're very foolish, right? They perceive that the parable is about them, that they would seize him and kill him and they're like yeah that parable's about us let's seize him and kill him <laughs> it's like you're fulfilling it right it's just crazy how that all works out right there that even though they realize it's about them they don't think hey maybe we should repent they're like no let's seize him and kill him and fulfill what he said the proving that hey uh when the Lord comes, he's going to destroy those wicked men. They don't think, hey, we don't want to be destroyed. Right? So, uh, yeah, that's just crazy how that is. Uh, but you see how our sinful nature is, this rebel, rebel without a cause. You want this authority, right? It's like how a lot of people are, especially us all when we're younger especially when we're teenagers, right? Where we all want to be our own, our own head of the household, our own boss, our own leader, our own king, or even our own God, right? 
we make the rules and we do what we want, right? And we just fight for that. And that's exactly what we see here with the Pharisees, that same kind of rebellious nature, but in adults. You can see the same thing with a lot of Christendom and a lot of religions as well, but mainly focused on Christendom or those who like to say that they worship Jesus, uh, that they're more like legalistic Pharisees and the scribes and Sadducees here, where it's more about their authority and their education and what have you, right? Because that's just how we are. And even when it's pointed out to us, like how Jesus pointed it out to them, how they are, they just stuck with it. <laughs> how dare you point out how we are? Let's grab them and kill them. When he pointed out, that's exactly how they are. Right? It's just, it's strange because there's times where uh, I talk to these people, namely a lot of different Catholics, and you you show them their hypocrisy and they'll just double down on it right you show them how they're wrong they'll even agree with you like they did here they agreed to, with this parable that yeah those people should be destroyed but then they're like no 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 no, no. we want to keep that authority anyway we're not going to repent it's that same thing you you talk to like uh some of these catholics you talk to them about grace you are like, yeah, it's unearned, it's undeserved, it's a free gift of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, then why do you say that you need to work to be in a state of grace? You need to earn the grace. Isn't that a contradiction? How does that make any sense? Like, you say it's the free gift, but you, you have to pay for it with your works. Because if you don't do the works and all these different things, then you're not going to get the free gift. I mean, you don't see how that's a contradiction. and They'll just double down on it. A lot of times they'll just say, yeah, you got to work for the grace. But the grace is unearned and undeserved. And it's like, okay, um, what do you do with that? It's, they're hard-hearted and prideful. And the Catholics, a lot of times they live vicariously through the Catholic Church and the Roman pontiff, their, their pope. They live vicariously through them. So if you destroy their authority, you're basically destroying that Catholic you're talking to. You're destroying their authority because they see themselves as part of that Catholic church, that family. And they'll fight for that because it boosts the ego, right? We're part of the church from the uh, that they have. Jesus and the apostles established, and we're the one true church, and you got to be part of our church to be saved. And when you show them that, uh, no, you are an apostate church that is falling away from what Jesus and the apostles actually taught, you destroy that. You destroy that little bit of ego they have, and you cause a narcissistic injury. So you can tell these Catholics are narcissists is because of how they react to the truth. Now, uh, they seem like normal, reasonable people, right? And you can talk to them, and they're fine, you know, talking just like you talk to anybody, really, right? But then when you disagree with them on, let's say, a Catholic view, they'd be like, okay, let's talk about that. And then when you show them how they're wrong and you're right, when you're talking just like this, nice and calm, not being rude or disrespectful, you're just showing them, hey, look, something like Jesus had brothers and sisters, or, or Joseph consummated the marriage with Mary after she had Jesus. <clears throat> you know, something simple that's not even a, like, what's the big deal? What's the big deal that Mary is not a virgin? Why is that such a big deal? Like, she was a virgin when she conceived and, and gave birth to Jesus. But then she consummated the marriage with her husband and she's no longer a virgin. What's the big deal about that? Why is that so off? 
and taboo. And then all of a sudden, you know, because of narcissistic injury, all of a sudden these reasonable people start getting all upset. And, you know, you don't talk about religion and politics. And, and, and uh, they start just throwing out ad hominem attacks. They'll start using straw man arguments. They'll start just going off on Luther, how Luther is just the devil. And Protestant, uh, Protestants, uh, Protestants, Protestants, and they just all of a sudden, like they short circuit, like they're AI or something, and you mess up their programming, right? And they they don't want to repent, to turn from their unbelief to belief, their unbelief. And how Jesus already saved us to belief in how Jesus already saved us. They don't want to do that. Right? Because it takes away from their own authority and their own life. And their own power to save themselves. To feed their own ego. Thinking I'm better than other people because I'm in God's one true church. And I'm doing all these things to earn my place in heaven. Because I'm so great. And since I mentioned that, I might as well end the video with this parable that Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 18. I mean, it's what Jesus says. And I think it's weird because there's a time I was reading John 6, verse 63, where Jesus says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And they were saying, oh, so you're saying the flesh profits nothing? They'd be like, no, but you just said it. I'm saying what Jesus said. I'm reading what Jesus is quoted saying by John the Apostle. It's not me saying it. I'm just reading what Jesus said. Right? And it's weird how they, how they do that. I don't know if you've experienced that, but... There'll be times where I don't put my own words into a comment. I'll just quote scripture, like a copy and paste kind of thing of a scripture, a verse or two, maybe a paragraph like this. And they'll act as though that's your opinion. Oh, so you think this? And it's like, why are they acting like that's my word? That's the Bible. That's the inspired word of God. That's God saying it. That's not me. Why are you attributing it to me? But you know that they do this subconsciously because they don't want to admit the truth that they're rejecting God and what he says. So they have to convince themselves that it's you, it's your word, it's your translation and your interpretation. And they're not rejecting God, they're rejecting you. Right? And it's just weird, this defense mechanism that goes on. I'm not rejecting God, I'm rejecting a man. No, that's not what's going on here. I'm not the one making up this doctrine. I'm not the one who wrote the Bible. You're rejecting the inspired word of God, not me. You just like to project it to me. Blame the messenger instead of the message for some reason. But anyway, here in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14, it says, and he, Jesus, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And this is the same attitude you get from Catholics and Seventh-day Adventists and other legalists. Like they got this attitude that, oh, what we're doing makes us righteous and others, you're not righteous because you're not doing what I'm doing. Right. So that's how they despise others. They put you down like you need to be like me. You're not doing what you ought to be doing. Right. So he says, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And this sounds a lot like Matthew 7, right? Where Jesus says, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom. Right? He says that these people said, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in thy name, cast the devils in thy name, done many wonderful works in thy name. 
And what does Jesus say to them? Who are you? I don't know you. But that's exactly how this Pharisee is coming across, right? In that same manner. But verse 13, it says, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so he's admitting the truth about himself. You know, he's not only has sins that he needs to be paid for, but he himself is a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And if you're thinking that you're doing what you need to do to earn heaven, to earn salvation, you're exalting yourself. God resisteth the proud and give his grace unto the humble. You see how this guy just admitted what he was. He received grace. He didn't earn it or deserve it. It's grace. Right? So, just to wrap it up. They want to destroy the word of God like this. But since they can't do that, because... The people look at Jesus as a prophet. They look at the King James as authoritative. They can't just do this to it. So what do they do? Okay, well, we have to bring up other ones. Right? And to get you to doubt in the true Messiah. And that's kind of what happened after Jesus showed up. All of a sudden, a bunch of other people claiming to be the Messiah showed up. And it's just a, a way to just dismiss everybody. Oh, yeah, everybody's the Messiah. Yeah, whatever. So Jesus is just another one of those guys like these, these other ones are claiming they're the Messiah. And he died like the rest of them. Right? So that's the same thing they get you going. Oh, the King James is just like any other Bible. Whatever, you pick whichever one you want. And, and you basically decide for yourself which one's best. And. So it's basically, if you were <clears throat> lost out on a desert island and you had the King James Bible, you wouldn't have everything you needed because you also need the other translations to compare it to because you don't know the Greek and Hebrew. So you need the other translations to compare it to, and then you have to decide for yourself which one's correct. So basically, whichever one agrees with whatever you think it ought to be, your imagination, your speculation, your personal beliefs. Or you need to have the original Greek and Hebrew with you and the education to fluently understand the Hebrew and the, the Koine Greek so that you can know for sure what is being said, right? But, uh, yeah. So... God's not going to be able to reach the simple, right? He's only reaches the educated, the only the, the super high up, which I guess is, I have to continue this. <laughs> I, I, this is, I plan this to be the last part. First Corinthians chapter one. And, uh, I guess, you can start at verse 18 and read on if you really want to read this. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to read this bottom part here, starting at verse 25. But I recommend starting at verse 18 and reading the end of the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But it says here, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things that are despised, hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he hath 
He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And you know, that's what a lot of people end up glorying in, is their education, who they were taught by, their denomination. They're not glorying in Jesus and knowing the, the Lord. But you know what? The uneducated, the simple. We glory in the Lord. We're the despised. We are the base things of the world. And we just trust God. We know that he brought his word to us. He didn't need to use other men to get to us. As in, he needed the, the rich and the educated and the high status people, the, the kings and the rulers of the world and the religious leaders. He doesn't need them. And they act as though God needs them to be able to reach us. When I don't know about you, but I didn't get saved because anybody came reaching, reaching out to me. I didn't have someone knocking on the door. I didn't get invited to a church. God drew me to him. I wanted the truth and I started looking. And I was looking in all kinds of different places and eventually... I found Jesus because he was drawing me to him and I was just following the drawing. I didn't go to some education, some seminar, some college. And some people, they, they look down on that. Oh, what's your education? All this. What does it matter? Does that change the word of God? No. It's your excuse to reject God because he doesn't agree with your education. But like we just read, God chooses the foolish things, the weak things, the despised things. Even the wretched sinners, like the harlots and the publicans. People like me and maybe like you. Or I always saw myself as a step down from God using a donkey to talk to Balaam. He used a donkey to talk to him, to humble him, having a donkey rebuke him. Right? But I see it as God trying to humble you all by using someone like me. You, I'm not quite a donkey. What I, what, how I picture myself is you're walking down the street and you happen to look over and see a dog drop a deuce. And you're like, oh, that, I didn't want to see that. But then all of a sudden you hear a voice after the dog leaves coming from that area. Like, what is that? And that that deuce is talking to you, telling you the gospel. And you're like, what? I'm not listening to a, a dog deuce. Well, God chooses the base things of the world, people like me, to talk to you about the gospel. To humble you. You think God's going to come to you by opening up the clouds and rolling the red carpet down and walking right up to you and talking to you. Or using the Pope himself or some other political or religious leader to come talk to you face to face. No, eat the humble pie and listen to the dog deuce. <laughs> All right. So thanks for watching and take care. All right, here's the three verses that I like to put in all the videos here. Isaiah 34, 16, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read so that Jesus doesn't tell you what he tells the Sadducees here in Matthew 22, 29. You do err not knowing the scriptures. It's not that you err in error because you don't know the, the one true church that happens to be your denomination or that you don't know your, the, the fundamental beliefs or the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed or whatever creed that you don't know the magisterium or the clergy or you don't know your favorite pastor or priest that's why you're in error no you're in error because you don't know the scriptures you need the scriptures to test to see whether or not those are correct whether those are the right traditions whether those are legitimate clergy whether that church is actually following god and whether those creeds line up those fundamental beliefs are found in the scriptures because 
Knowing the scriptures is knowing God. Like we read here in John 17, 3, Jesus says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And this is a deep knowing. As Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God in like manner, so that you may be born again, that his word, his seed, it abides in your heart. Will you truly believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he died in your place and gives you his life in exchange so that your righteousness, your good and your bad, your life, past, present, and future, died 2,000 years ago. Your life is his. He can do what he wants with it. He puts it to death, and he gives you his life in exchange, his perfect, eternal life. That's the deep knowing you need to know of God. So, there you go. Do you know him? Do you want to know him? You get to know him. Thanks again for watching. Take care. So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Amen. It's like that. Yeah. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Amen.